Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to the Sticky Center event, Building People Power, Lessons from Grassroots Citizens Movements in Cameroon and the U.S. with Kawala. Um, I particularly uh, want to thank at the outset, or greet at the outset, uh, members of the class of 1957 whose uh, Great Issues Innovation Fund uh, has made this possible. And I also want to welcome members of the class of 82 um, who are, uh, I think, being dragooned into doing something similar. So uh, by the 57s, at least we hope so. Um, anyway, welcome to all of you. Um, so tomorrow will mark the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King. And I can't think of a better topic for the day. Um, and today was, of course, the anniversary of his last speech uh, than building people power. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, Kawala here on a return engagement to discuss the subject. Uh, and because she is one of the people really striving to make people power a reality in Africa, and specifically in her home country of Cameroon, it's hard to think of someone who could speak better to this uh, subject. Um, I am in the embarrassing position of having, we've had you here I think three times now, and by some fluke, uh, I was elsewhere, and every time I would come back from uh, uh, wherever I was traveling, uh, I would hear, oh, Kawala was a rock star. And I'd say, I missed it again. Um, you know, this is a woman who's actually spoken to a, um, an Arctic uh, studies workshop on leadership. And if you get that kind of response from an Arctic studies workshop, you, and you missed it, you know you're doing something wrong. Anyway. Um, on all of her visits to Dartmouth, she has displayed the kind of passion, insight, and reason that has had a galvanizing effect on everyone she's come in contact with. And uh, she's really become an essential part of our uh, programming uh, during the summer when we have uh, our young African leaders here who are in their own right superstars and perhaps not so easily impressed, but in this case, very, very impressed. And. Um, I should say that when it comes to building people power, she has been at it for a good long while, from her very first demonstration outside the Cameroonian embassy in Washington in 1989, a year when uh, I guess we were all hoping that we'd see democracy uh, spread everywhere, to her longtime engagement with Cameroon's opposition Social Democratic Front, uh, to her ceaseless efforts to bring real democracy to her country, and her 12, 2011 campaign for the presidency of Cameroon, she's been absolutely unyielding in her efforts. She has shown an ability to work both at the grassroots uh, as she builds a coalition for democracy in Cameroon and to challenge uh, the highest officials uh, in her country. Uh, not unlike Dr. King, who uh, we all remember was uh, going to support striking sanitation workers in Memphis when he was uh, when he was killed. She has also taken on a raft of different issues, including human trafficking, the fight against Boko Haram, and the rights of the disabled. Um, all along, she has also been a leading entrepreneur. Uh, her firm, Strategies, how do you say that so it comes out in all uh, capitals <laughs> and with an exclamation at the, I, we, we might as well just tweet it then, I guess. <laughs> Uh, is, now, um, is now 20 years old and offering services in leadership, uh, strategy, organizational development, uh, and the like to multinational firms and development organizations, not just in Africa, but on five continents. She has been honored by the World Bank, profiled by Newsweek and others as a pioneer in her field and a force for the empowerment of women in business in Africa and elsewhere. Uh, she's also bringing out the very best in Africa's youth so that they can help better create better conditions for their generation. She is the president of the Cameroon Gender and Development Network, the founder of, I hope I say it correctly, Cameroon Abasso, uh, which is a citizenship movement to help grassroots organize to defend uh, their interests and have a voice in defining and implementing policies at the national level. She is really a force to be reckoned with. I'm delighted she is here today. Kawala, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh-oh, uh good afternoon. Okay. 
Um, it's a real pleasure to be at Dartmouth once again. And I have been here for two days already and have already had uh, an amazing time interacting with the students in the African politics class, um, in the gender class, um, at Tuck. Uh, so I, I wear a lot of different hats. And when I come to Dartmouth, I can be sure, thanks to Amy, <laughs> um, to, to put on all of those hats, which, uh, which for me is always uh, a wonderful, a wonderful moment, and I do want to say thank you very much to Amy um, for being the connection um, between myself and and Dartmouth. Uh, I think we met virtually, right, <laughs> through through a mutual friend, uh, and then and then made that connection that brought me that brought me here. Um, as we thought about what to talk about for for this talk, uh, I was. Uh, very privileged to be in Washington, D.C. Um, last, was it last week? The, the March for Our Lives, yes. Um, and um, to see firsthand uh, the, the grassroots renaissance <laughs> uh, at one of its high points in, in the United States. And um, we thought, you know, uh, I am a firm believer in, in grassroots. Um, work in grassroots mobilization and in the fact that if we want to transform societies, we must go from the bottom up. And uh, so we thought this would be a good moment to talk about uh, what are some of the lessons we can already be learning as we look at the grassroots movement here and as we look at what um, is happening in Cameroon, but thankfully, in many, many places on our continent, um, we are seeing very strong grassroots movement. Um, so today we live in this world that is challenged by such tremendous complex problems that affect such large numbers of people and that literally are cases of life and death. So we are seeing thousands, sometimes millions of people um, who lose their lives uh, because of you know, some of these challenges. And I'm sure you can, you can add other ones <laughs> um, uh, up there. So we, we already live you know, in this, and, and somebody might say we have been the cause of, of, of the way we've li lived up to now has been the cause of some of these problems. Um, but these are our challenges as, as world citizens of, of today. Um, and in the face of this, in far too many parts of the world, we have a real imbalance of power. In far too many places, uh, we have political power, which is completely at odds on some of these key issues with citizens, which seems to have been captured by specific minority groups. Um, and uh, I left the, that dollar sign up there because these minority groups tend to um, either be acting in the interest of, of money or have money to influence um, that power. So the, the money plays a very, very strong role here. Um, and we see in far too many places in the world the eroding of human rights and civil liberties, even in places like in your country where we thought you know, done, it was finished, right? You, your rights were, <laughs> you had them. And we see this eroding all over the world. Um, pick your continent and you're going to find at least one glaring example of where this is going on um, in the world. For some of us, we've never had them. <laughs> so Cameroon has been independent for 57, 58 years. Um, and we've had two presidents in that time. Um, our current president has been there for 35 years. He is 85 years old. There should be an election this year, and he will be running. Um, so, uh, and so, so some of us have lived with repression uh, all of our lives, but, but we have always lived with that 
hope and that example from other countries where we say, oh yes, we want to be like them. We want to get to that place where we have our rights. So it is disturbing to see um, rights kind of you know, being taken away or being eroded in, in other parts of the world. Um, and we also see political power that is threatening or uh, sometimes eliminating institutions and rule of law. And once again, even in countries where we thought, oh, this is done, they've established their institutions, they've established rule of law, um, luckily, that was done in those countries because we definitely see people who have the intention that were they able to, uh, would, would threaten those. Um, and in the face of this, people often ask me, um, and, and uh, I, I think they ask that to people who, who live in dictatorships all over the world, it's like, why do you put up with this? Why is it that 23 million Cameroonians and we have every resource you can think of. We are a very rich country. Oil, gold, diamonds, cobalt, coltan, uh, favorable conditions for agriculture. We, we do not have a single resource that we could be asking for. And 23 million people, 40% of them live on less than $2 a day with all of that all of those resources. And people say, why? How do you put up with this for 35 years? And the single best answer I can give is fear. What dictators manipulate is fear. They manipulate it. Uh, I have one of the most sophisticated dictators in the world. I, um, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here at the same time as Ambassador Johnny Carson, whom I've known uh, over the years. And um, uh, he has had the opportunity to visit Cameroon and I think to meet President Bia. Um, and he is not a brutal dictator. So this is not the guy who's going to line people up on the beach and shoot them. Um, the, the incidents of violence up to about two years ago um, could be spaced out over four or five years. Um, but he uses just enough violence and just randomly enough, because that's the secret, that he everybody is afraid. So if we are in this room, and these four people are challenging me, and I am the dictator. Um, and, uh, I, and, and the loudest voice is Melody. And I walk into the room, and I punish this gentleman over here. The three of them are completely confused, right? The four of them are completely confused. What happened? Melody was talking loudest. She was at the front of the line. Why am I? taking it out on him. And so what they do is that what I have just done is made them uncertain of where the line is. And so they all step back, <laughs> right? So this is, um, this is uh, Bia's technique, and he has used it very, very skillfully uh, over the 35 years. Now, don't get me wrong. If he really feels threatened, he will send his army out to shoot to kill. So um, <laughs> it's not like uh, uh, this is a, a, a nice person, but, um, but enough fear is used to keep us paralyzed. Um, and it's also intimidation all the time. In 2016, I think I was arrested five times. I have to explain to people that I wasn't demonstrating any of those times. They just thought I was going to demonstrate. <laughs> you know, so these were preventive arrests. <laughs> um, uh, but, but, you know, that instills fear very well. You, you intimidate people you are organizing. Now find out that the leader has been arrested. Half of them are like, okay, we don't want to do this anymore. Um, so um, uh, 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 paralyzed by fear. And I see that in your society a little bit the way that fear is being manipulated. Um, people getting fired from top government physicians without anybody being sure why 
why this person is fine. That's a, I was like, this is straight up Bia right here. I can, <laughs> I recognize this. Um, you know, people feeling like they have to be more loyal to the individual than they do to the state. Um, you know, these are all tactics of intimidation um, and, and instilling fear. Um, population that becomes uninformed by facts. So that also I've watched in your society. So, so you guys are new to fake news. We have been <laughs> at it for 35 years. You know, um, uh, government, political leadership creating sufficient doubt in the minds of people as to the veracity of, of facts, right? And then the population is confused. It's, it's what, what they're saying, you know, the government is saying this, the private sector is saying this, whom do I believe? I don't have, and, and, and I see sometimes I listen to uh, um, some of my American friends mocking part of the population saying, how can these people believe that? And this is incredible. And I say, watch out, because when you do not have a culture of you know, checking four or five news sources and establishing your own channels for getting information, when you're just sitting in front of the TV, if somebody creates doubt and that person is in a strong position of, of leadership, in any society, a significant portion of the population is going to be affected. Um, so it's, it's, it's human behavior. Um, and then we are fueled by our subjective identities. So we are fueled by uh, our identity because we have created this uncertainty with regard to facts. I have to hold on to something. So I hold on to my religion. I hold on to my ethnicity. I hold on to uh, my village where I, where I belong to. Um, and I, once again, um, I found it very interesting in your um, uh, 2016, was it 2016 election? Um, the, the, the tribes were created. It was a tribal election. I was like, wow. Okay, once again, I know this, I recognize this. <laughs> it was a tribal election and you made the tribe feel afraid. People are coming to take away what is ours. If we are not in a good position, it's because those people from that other tribe are a threat to us. And that will work on human beings every single time every single time, because we are all tribal. <laughs> um, and, and if we appeal to that, if leadership appeals to that, it works for a certain percentage of the population. And then citizens who look at this and say, we want to fight back, we don't want this to happen, we see what's happening, we're scared of it, um, are dispersed and disorganized. They don't have, they don't have the machine. They don't have the mechanisms. And you have citizens saying, something is wrong. We need to do something. But where do I go? Where do I meet those other people so that we can organize and we can fight back uh, ag against this? So um, in our case, it is that the machines have often been beaten out of uh, repression. Sometimes they were never allowed to be constructed. In your case, I think it is that those machines got a little complacent and uh, they were not so much in contact with their base, and they were not uh, so well oiled and ready to face this kind of um, to face this kind of crisis. So this imbalance, um, and I, you know, we could we could pick uh, the Philippines and probably have the same conversation. We could pick some countries in South America and have the same conversation um, in the Arab world and have the same conversation. So we're seeing this in many places um, in our world. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Africa. So in Africa, in this crisis, in, in this imbalance, we, it's, it's facing both crisis and opportunity. And we're not doing well at either one, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so we have this huge continent. 
Today, we are over a billion people. Um, we are the most people, forget that, we're the most, uh, for those who believe in race, uh, we are the most racially diverse continent uh, on, on, on the face of the earth. Um, so huge numbers of people, and when we were getting close to that billion mark, everybody was like, the population dividend, so Africa is gonna, you know. Um, we, all, we have also have a very young population. We are the world's future workforce, very near future. <laughs> 2020, we will be the largest workforce. There's a question though. Africa is not creating the jobs for these hundreds of millions of people. So we're gonna have all these citizens who have all these needs and we don't have the work that has been done politically um, to be able to create that. Um, the other thing that people don't think about, uh, Africa is urbanized, the fastest urbanizing continent in the world. So right now, 40% of us live in cities, and that will be 50% by 2030. Um, Lagos, Kinshasa are going to be amongst the 10 largest cities in the world uh, very soon. Crisis. These are cities where 70% of the people live in slums. They don't have water, they don't have sanitation, uh, they don't have, nobody's picking up the garbage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we always talk about the potential of African women. And of course, <laughs> I strongly believe uh, in that potential. And I think there's some people here that I see, Lima Bowie up there, I think she's been on your uh, ca campus, Wangari Matai, uh, Don was talking about her um, yesterday. Um, African market women, wh which are part of the strongest economic force on the continent. Um, I like to remind that this dynamism is not recent. Uh, so um, this first picture is of Amina of Zaria, this one right here. Uh, she, she was the first person to form a, gov a government on the continent of Africa was Amina of Zaria in the 1400s um, in the area that's called Nigeria today. Um, uh, uh, she, was, she had a notion of a state and expanded uh, to create one of the largest states at that time. And this is uh, Zinga of Angola who fought the Portuguese uh, for over 50 years and is, cre is considered one of the greatest military strategists. Uh, of her time, that's 1500s. Um, again, economic power. This is uh, Bethlehem Alemu, who, uh, who has a company called Soul Rebels. Um, she started making shoes out of the tires, you know, in, in the great African recycling tradition, uh, out of old tires, um, and today has a multinational company that's out of Ethiopia and sells shoes to um, the rest of the world. So once again, Tremendous potential. However, you know, and, 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 and African women, as I uh, pointed out, we work. We have never had a, uh, an issue of women not working. We have always worked. <laughs> um, uh, and, and we have very high economic activity rate. Um, agriculture in, on the continent, I like to say, from the farm to the plate, women control agriculture on our continent. Um, we've also made great progress in terms of um, political representation. So we're way ahead of the, U the US uh, <laughs> on some of those figures. Rwanda is number one in the world with 63% uh, of women in its lower house. I think it's the only country in the world that has more women than men uh, in its lower house. South Africa, Senegal, um, all doing very well in that area. However, all of, these, all of this potential should not negate the fact that African women are amongst the poorest people on the face of our planet. So once again, lots of opportunity. We are still facing crisis. And um, I'll just run through some, some pictures that uh, really demonstrate that in terms of energy. 
land. So one of the huge problems we are facing right now, we have a significant portion of the arable land in the world. And so land grabbing, we are seeing every nationality uh, from Americans to Chinese to uh, Europeans to Indians come in um, trying to grab huge portions of land um, on which they intend to grow food, not to feed these, you know, three Africans that are, uh, 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 not to feed these 25% uh, of Africans that are undernourished, but to export to feed their own populations. Um, so uh, interesting. Um, right now, six out of 10 of the fastest growing economies in the world are African. Number one is Ghana. Number two is Ethiopia. Uh, on that list are Tanzania, Rwanda, and so on, all seeing um, <clears throat> more than 5% economic uh, growth. And this has been the case for like the last 10 years, these um, Africa being amongst the fastest growing economies in the world. However, we have to keep in mind that once we get outside agriculture, 75% of Africans are working in the informal sector, which means no minimal wage, no secure, no job security, um, no insurance, no, no health insurance, no retirement insurance, nothing. Um, so uh, while these economies are growing, once again, citizens are not yet seeing the benefit of this, of this growth. Um, also important to uh, to remind that we are the, the mineral base <laughs> of the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are producing, and I just took a couple of uh, examples there, but you, you know, if you go with gold, if you go with coal tan, and so on, um, we are producing uh, a significant portion of the world's minerals. <laughs> so I always like to, to end uh, on that part with, you know, to remember Africa is not poor. And so uh, we are not a poor continent. We are, however, for the most part, still poorly run, which results in Africans being poor. So um, this is the, the, both the opportunity and the crisis. Um, <clears throat> and the, those crises in Africa, um, we can take a quick look at what, what they look like. Um, we have seen an extreme resurgence of violence on the continent. This is our, this is our, the blue is, is for the most part our um, terrorism belt. So there's a, there is today a terrorism belt running all across. Africa, um, from the Sahel uh, to Boko Haram in my country and in Nigeria, uh, to what is happening in Kenya and Somalia, um, and of course what is happening and has been happening for the last 20 years in Eastern DRC. Um, so many, many millions of Africans are subject to violence on a daily basis in their, li in their lives, thanks to this poor governance which we've seen. Um, a lack of basic human rights, of basic freedoms, uh, the right to assemble, the right to speak. Uh, um, we were protesting here um, the right to assemble. Um, which is taken away from us, our government, you know, today they give it to us, tomorrow they take it away, and the next day, you never know uh, <laughs> what's, what's, what's going on. Um, and I think very importantly, in spite of progress, and um, uh, people often ask me, are you an Afro uh, optimist or an Afro pessimist? And I say, I'm an Afro realist, <laughs> um, because I, uh, I am totally, totally optimistic about the ability of my continent to solve these problems. Um, I think we have to be very realistic as to where we are and what is the task that, that is before us. And that means we don't have water. 
we have 32 million children right now on the continent who are not in school. And the likelihood is that at least 50% of them will never see the four walls of a classroom. Um, you know, we our basic services, water, electricity. I'm so happy. I don't know if some of you know, uh, saw these um, 30 or so African heads of states uh, last week in Kigali, they were signing this big trade agreement, free movement and goods, and, and that's great, but we're not going to have any kind of trade without electricity. You know, you have to solve the foundational problems. Um, so what does this mean for us as citizens, as African citizens? Um, for us, in and, and I'm talking here from the point of view of those of us on the continent, who still, I'm a Central African. Central Africa, West Africa, doing great, really doing great. I think there's one country left, and the people are on the streets right now. It's Togo, and uh, you know he's gonna go down. So uh, all the other countries in West Africa are democracies of some level or another. Southern Africa, doing not badly. South Africa is a big challenge, but they are not doing badly. Elections are established as a mode of transfer of power. Uh, citizens have some basic rights, et cetera, et cetera. Central Africa, the last bastion of the dictators. We do not have a single democratic country in our region, not one. So we are the Cameroons, the Congos, both of them. Uh, Equatorial Guinea, Chad, Central African Republic, uh, who else is in there? Um, uh, uh, Gabon. So, so we are that last region in Africa that um, has not even made the first steps towards really uh, a democratic and uh, system of, of, of governance. Um, we are also probably the richest part of the continent. We're where the oil is, Gulf of Guinea, we're where all these minerals are. Um, and, and so, you know, some people link the two. <laughs> um, so we have to get rid of dictators. People tell me all the time, well, how, you know, how do you think we can negotiate with Bia or Kabila or, you can't, you can't. This is the nature of who they are <laughs> uh, means that it's us or them. <laughs> you know, that's the way they've run the countries for 35 years. I don't think Bia is going to change at 85 and after 35 years. Um, so we have to get rid of them. And luckily, we have examples, beautiful examples in Africa where citizens have organized and gotten rid of them. Tunisia, Burkina Faso. Burkina, I, I love Burkina Faso. <laughs> they are my heroes. Uh, um, and to, to me and to our movement, we have to rethink our countries. We inherited colonial states. Colonial states are designed to exploit the majority for the benefit of a minority and to take the wealth outside the country. What happens in Congo, in Cameroon, in Chad? We have a little ruling class that exploits the majority for the benefit of that minority and usually takes the wealth outside the country. So we, we got rid of colonialism, but we didn't rethink the system. The same thing for these armed forces, which are repressive and oppressive and have no respect for human rights. They are the for armed forces of the colonizer. That's what they were designed to do. These armed forces under the French, under the British, uh, and, 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 and whoever else, were, they were not there for the protection of citizens. They were not there for the well-being of citizens. They were designed to protect the colonizer. We got rid of the colonizer. We replaced them with people who look like us and talk like us and sound like us. But the armed forces are still protecting those people against the citizens. Um, so for us, we have to rethink uh, the whole idea of the state. And this means exercising our 
colonial demons, and we have a lot of them, <laughs> um, and, and, and reinventing and then reforming our institutions and, and systems. And for me, elections only make sense after you've done this. What we have seen in Africa today, you know, and that's a message to all of you who um, sometimes support elections and, and you know, want to help with electoral systems. What we've seen is that if you hold elections under a dictator, it becomes a tool for him to stay in power. So we have to get rid of these guys in order to be able, and they are all guys, by the way, I'm not using them. <laughs> um, and, and maybe just uh, uh, for us, reinventing our own democracies means going back to our traditional systems of governance and looking at the elements within that that we can use to build our democracies. So that means that we look at inclusion, which is a significant part of African traditional um, governance. And I've just put some examples up there. It means that we look at gender balanced power, which is a fundamental a, a, a view of many African societies. The place where I come from in Cameroon, there is no instance of power where you have a man where you do not have his female counterpart. So our conception of power is that you have to balance it in terms of gender. Um, you know, executive accountability exists within our traditional systems of, of governance. Um, and of course we can benefit I always say that the, the only advantage to being really late to the table of democracy and development is that you can learn from everybody else, right? So we can, we can leapfrog <laughs> uh, uh, for, for certain things in, in terms of decentralized government, in terms of e-government, and, 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 and so on. Um, there's, there's the Burkina Bay. They did this in 2013. 2013, so they were able to go to this, organize, go to the streets, get rid of their dictator who'd been there for 27 years. And they took 18 months as a country to rethink their state, to rethink their society. I don't feel like they went far enough, they didn't push themselves far enough, but they did do this. And it's a wonderful model um, for other African countries. Um, so looking at what is going on in Africa and what is going on here in the United States, what lessons can we learn? The first is the importance and the necessity of political education. I am so blown away by your 16 and 17, some of them 13 year, year olds who are giving themselves a political education, who are figuring out why is it that we have guns in our schools? Why is it that we are dying from gun violence? And they're figuring out the political system behind that, that creates that effect. Um, until you have that political education, you're just a complainer, you're not, you're not an active citizen, you're just complaining. So educating people at the grassroots is extremely important. Overcoming fear, and I think your young people, the advantage they have is youth, right? They just, they, they don't know, <laughs> right? <laughs> they don't know how dangerous it is, dangerous it is what, what, what they're doing, so they go ahead and do it. Um, and so, um, but in our society, we have to teach people to overcome fear. Um, just as I came in here, there was a journalist uh, asking us how many, how many um, nonviolent demonstrations we'd had since 2011. I was like, I don't know. Somebody on my team sent the answer and said 37. And so we're on the street a lot. <laughs> um, one of our reasons for doing that, helping people to overcome fear. You know, even if we get arrested, we get released. You know, even if we, we, helping people to see that you will not die if you go up against this government. 
that is a possibility, but <laughs> most, most of the time you will not. Um, and then um, progressive political action and progressive there is in all senses of the word. Progressive as in step by step. I love the fact that the, the kids that were out last week were saying, we're marching today and we will vote in November. Um, they understand that this is progressive. Just holding a march does not bring about political change, right? They know that they have to, um, that they have to show up at the polls. Um, uh, uh, um, I think it was good. I remember uh, I was here also, uh, I think, beginning of last year where there was health care on the table and people were not just protesting, they were showing up at the town halls and showing up so that the politicians could actually feel that pressure. So it's always, and this is where sometimes we lose people because they wanna go to a great march, wear a great t-shirt and then go home, <laughs> right? And it's, no, these are complex entrenched systems. And so to fight against them, we need a short, medium and long-term strategy. We can't do one thing and hope that change um, will come. Okay, I think that's the. Oh, Ooh. <laughs> okay. Um, other, another thing, and 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 we've actually used this in one of, with one of our groups uh, in learning from what what these young people in America are doing. It um, unlikely activists, right? So we're all saying kids, but. In reality, remember the civil rights movement? Kids. It, 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 it got fuel when very young people got into the movement. Um, and, and, and you know, we saw the women's march, you know, we thought women, great, but women are always part of the revolution. Always. Um, we don't talk about it afterwards, <laughs> but, but, but they have always been part. So people who look like unlikely activists, actually when we look at history, we discover they are the most likely are activists because people who are within the system and who have found their niche in the system are unlikely to bucket, right? It's very often those who, are, who feel very marginalized and who feel very much outside um, the system. Um, of course, people, People can see something in society, they can observe it, they can think it's horrible, they move into action only when um, uh, they feel like uh, this has impacted my, my, my life. And then action has to be clear, simple, and strategic. I loved what happened to one of the youth activists after the march, um, David Hogg, yes, right? Um, who got insulted by some media uh, 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 person, and he said, I'm not going to respond. I am going to hit you where it hurts, and got the advertisers, um, and, and you know, got his whole fan base to, to demand that our advertisers leave that show. That is being strategic, extremely strategic. Um, and so as we mobilize and as we learn from one another, these are some of the lessons uh, that, that, that we're learning. So it feels at the same time like a moment where we have this imbalance in political power, but it feels to us also like all over the world, um, citizens are waking up, they are standing up, and they are taking back their power. Thank you, and I will take questions. <laughs> yes, Al. I think one of the uh, things I've been seeing more and more is that a fundamental <laughs> part of what causes reaction is your number two point, which is the, the disruption of my norm, the disruption of my comfort. So as long as I can see that the issue is that, that community's issue, yes. then I don't respond. And we've seen that in this country and so many different issues mm -hmm. where 
Black communities were suffering with, mm -hmm. with drug addiction, overdoses. Mm -hmm. What do we do? Lock them up, throw away the key. Mm -hmm. When it moved to the white community, we all of a sudden now naloxone is a, is a requirement. Mm -hmm. If you were running a campaign and didn't have drug rehabilitation as part of your platform, you were in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with gun control. Gun mm -hmm. control, if you look at cities like in Chicago where... Mm -hmm. Uh, I work there, and we have a thousand plus deaths easily mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the uh, Inglewood area. That was acceptable but until it became a part of the normal uh, in 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 like in in Parkland. Mm -hmm. When it became their norm, then they responded. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's such a critical piece. Unfortunately, but until I disrupt your norm, yes. And and even if you're in poverty, if you're comfortable being in poverty, mm -hmm. until I disrupt that, we don't see change. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that's been really big in this country is that other people are seeing their normalities being disrupted. Yes. And I think one of the things I heard when when Donald Trump became president is that young black woman said welcome to and she was black welcome, welcome to, to my reality. reality yes <laughs> and so that's been a big disruption in this country yes so, yes. so if you could speak more about that about, about that disruption of the comfort zone the norm um, etc okay thank you I'm going to take a couple of questions at a time because I'm I'm watching the the, the, <laughs> the time also hey thank you um so I took a I really like the way you presented all your information and I'm left with these questions that I'm going to use in my classes. How do you educate people about what's going on? How do you overcome fear? And how do you organize and how do you create collective identity? Mm -hmm. And the, the question about education, I'm, the question is about uh, to what extent has online forms of education, digital learning, had an impact, made inroads in on the African continent? Mm -hmm. There was so much hope you know, maybe three or four years ago about, you know, this transformational potential. It doesn't seem to have borne itself out, at least not in this country, in mm -hmm. terms of eliminating inequality. Do you see any evidence for that, for online education really reaching poor people in mm -hmm. Africa? Mm -hmm. Okay. Was there a third hand up? Um, let's see, right here in the middle. We'll, we'll go this way and take... Uh, thank you. Um, not only your speech, but your work in Cameroons is truly admirable. Thank you. But as I watch what's happening in Western Cameroons, what I see is a nation, is a group of people who've been frustrated and um, <clears throat> removed from the political system over. Um, not Ahijo as well as Bia, yeah. both mm -hmm. presidents of mm -hmm. Cameroons, and are now moving into violence, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and being driven into violence too. Mm -hmm. What are? W would you spend a few minutes analyzing the the degree to which um, violence is not inevitable if Western Cameroonians are to gain any political rights at all? Okay, great. Yeah. He's been to Cameroon or studied Cameroon. <laughs> Just right behind you, I'll take the last person that had their hand up. Thank you. Um, I met you in the summer last yes. with the Yali fellows as well, so this conversation is ongoing. And I liked how after the conversation with the Yali fellows back, one of the things that we talked about, which I'm glad that you pointed out, was going back to revisit um, structures and upon which, because as Audrey Lord says, the master's tools cannot be used to destroy master's house. Mm -hmm. So revisiting these tools and the nation state is a tool of colonialism. Mm -hmm. The nation state and its political organizations are tools for, you know, upon which like these, these, um, these states are, are, these are their foundations. And so revisiting those foundations, those paradigms, I thought it was wonderful that, we're, mm -hmm. like, that, you, that you're arguing for that, that mm -hmm. you have for the return of that. Mm -hmm. But this sometimes the return to like this pre-colonial civilizations can sometimes be over romanticized mm -hmm. about what is there to what is there that's being reclaimed yes and so i know that you probably are in conversation know about this about selective reclamation and so what can you give some examples of that selective reclamation more specifically to cameroon what that looks like in different facets of of cameroonian right. society i know that you did that for the other other places, more specifically Cameroon, and also about when this reclamation is happening, it also speaks to power dynamics and also the politics of power, that who is having the ability 
to do this reclamation. Yes. Who is choosing what is it that we're returning to that is pre-colonial? Yes. So the indigeneity of like African civilization and that which is being, you know, selected in order to create this new and hybrid or whatever that is context specific, specific. to this, you know, well, and who's doing that? And so it's not necessarily a, from a move, as Professor Coley says, from knowledge to power, rather it's a move from um, from from power to knowledge. So yeah. who's having the power to ascertain that knowledge, knowledge. that will then influence the context in the, in the society? Thank you. Um, so, you know, bringing things home to people, disrupting their own um, uh, realities. Uh, I will speak to that um, and talk to the um, West Cameroon uh, uh, question a little bit, because right now in my country, we are, we are really at the brink of, of change. And it is anybody's bet. We could, we could manage to pull it in the right direction, or we could go into civil war. I cannot tell you standing here which which direction we are we are going to go. All I can do is work as hard as I can to pull it in uh, the right direction. And um, an element of that is that we have twenty percent of our so our colonial uh, heritage. Twenty percent of our our, part, our country was governed with by the British with Nigeria. Eighty percent was governed by the French. After colonial, after independence, we reunited and we became one country. And we were supposed to become one country with two equal states. One, you know, English speaking with an English uh, uh, system of um, education, practicing common law, and so on. And another one, francophone with uh, droit civil and uh, uh, a French system of education. The Anglophones have been marginalized for 57 years. And the Francophones kind of say, yeah, we kind of see there's discrimination over there. We kind of see that when they go to court, the magistrate doesn't speak English. Yeah, you're, in, you're in the English speaking part as an English speaking citizen, and the judge doesn't speak English. Um, you know, we kind of see that the police don't speak English over on the other side. Um, yeah, that is a problem, but I'm not about to, you know, get up and demonstrate for it. <laughs> so this is, this is the reality of citizens. Um, and uh, today, so to speak to, 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 to your questions today, for two years, the last two years, the Anglophones, as we call them, have been demonstrating nonviolently for 18 months, and they have they have been arrested. People have been put in jail. Some of them are still in jail two years later. Um, you know, real indiscriminate mass arrests. You know, thousands of young men. We would you know I'd get calls in the middle of the night. They just arrested 100 young men in this area. They just arrested in this area. We're running around trying to find lawyers, trying to even find them because the, the government doesn't even ex respect the law and tell us where they are and give access to legal uh, assistance and so on and so forth. Um, all of this was happening and 80% of the country is kind of like, they even bought the government's discourse, which was, look at these bad Anglophones over here. They're trying to divide the country. They are trying to, you know, so that was what the government was saying. The Francophones also felt like, I don't have good roads. I don't have a health system. I don't have good schools. So, you know, why are you all demonstrating over there and calling it an Anglophone problem? Because I have the same problems. So we really have seen our country, three years ago, if you asked a Cameroonian, you know, what does it mean to be Cameroonian? I bet all of my money that out of the first three things they would have said, one of them would have been, we are a bilingual country. That was part of our identity. Today, if you ask an English-speaking Cameroonian, they will tell you, I am an English-speaking Cameroonian. And there, many of them will not even say bonjour to you in French. <laughs> um, tr total transformation in a space of 24 months. Um, so we were faced with this problem. How do we get Francophones to better understand Anglophones? How is it that we, you know, because 
we have one single problem. It's the government. <laughs> um, so how is it that we you know, bring people together? We found, we started in November of last year, bringing women, Anglophone women and Francophone women together, um, just to talk, just for them to explain to each other what their reality was. Um, tremendous. I mean, within 30 minutes of the conversation, the, the Francophone women were ready to demonstrate. They were like, what? They're shooting at you at night. You have to gather your children and run to the bush, and your families are being split up because some are refugees. And that, this is the unacceptable. Um, so we always have to keep in mind that in this imbalance is the control of information. Governments control information, and very often citizens just don't have the information that they need to be able to organize. So um, we, we started in November, um, just before I, I came here, and there were people who thought I, I had been arrested. <laughs> uh, uh, um, we were out demonstrating, and we held the first demonstration of Cameroonian women who are demanding that the political power, one, our, our, our tactic was to ask for an appointment with the head of state. But we are demanding that before anything goes forward, this is supposed to be an electoral year, um, you know, they're, they're playing all the games and so on. And the women said, before you move forward, we want these problems solved. We want the shooting to stop. We, want, we are losing our children. When you kill a, 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 a civilian, it's our child. When you kill a soldier, it's our child. And so for the first time, we saw these two groups, Anglophone and Francophone. So I think sometimes just conversation, the other group just doesn't get it, just doesn't understand. And that's just who we are as humans. Um, so bringing them, them together. Um, so so to, 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 to answer your question, um, so I am a, an English-speaking Cameroonian, ethnically speaking. I come from the English-speaking part of Cameroon. Um, I grew up in the French-speaking part and have lived there all, all my life. Um, I refuse in 2018 to be defined by my colonial, by who colonized me. To me, this just doesn't make sense. And while I completely understand English-speaking Cameroonians who have been marginalized because they speak English and because they have a different culture that comes out of that colonization. I say we have to get past that and look at the problem, which is a problem of Africans faced with bad governance. And the Francophones are our allies in this. They are not our enemy. Like I often ask when I go to the English-speaking region, Really, you, the woman who's sitting on the side of the road roasting corn to be able to send your children to school in Bamenda, which is in the English-speaking part, is your enemy the woman who's sitting on the side of the road roasting fish in Douala? Is that the person who's the problem here? Um, so getting people to see each other's realities. And what we've begun to do is we, we have visit trips back and forth with def different groups of people. Are we going to be able to do enough in time? Um, because now the English speakers have become violent. Um, and that's why we are on the brink of, of, of civil war. Um, we are working towards that. And we, we are very conscious of the clock running. Um, in, in that sense. Um, have we been able to use technology in the work that we do? Yes, of course. Um, we, in, in a country, so the biggest technology in Africa is the cell phone, right? <laughs> um, and uh, the ability to send messages uh, back in, and, 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 and forth using um, the, the SMS, the, the, the message service. Um, online education in Cameroon, no. There are countries where it's making a real difference. Tunisia, South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana are some of the countries that are really uh, able to use that. Internet um, access in Cameroon is still only about 
I think it's up to about 24% now. So we still have a significant portion of the population that doesn't even have access. Um, and that's true in many other countries uh, on the continent. So, so is technology useful for the work that we do? Unquestionably. Is the technology the revolution? No. <laughs> um, it's the people that it, it's, it's a tool for what we do. Um, what are we going to re reclaim and who has the, 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 the power to reclaim it? Um, I am not, uh, again, an Africa uh, romanticist, you know, so everything was not perfect before the colonizer came because it was a human endeavor. It was, you know, um, so it couldn't be perfect. Were some things better? I certainly think so. Um, is it unfortunate that we did not have the possibility to experiment our own uh, journey in terms of, of building who we were as people? Absolutely. Um, so I, in, in my opinion, it is not a question of going back to a certain time. It is a question of knowing, of getting the knowledge, um, because most Africans don't know. Just, just, we just don't know. We, we, we study a Cameroonian in school studies European history. We know our French history. We know our British history really, really well. And we don't know our Cameroonian history. Um, so it is a question of knowing our Cameroonian history. Um, you know, I remember the first time that I did a talk and I talked about traditional governance. There was an Ivorian guy and he said, there is no governance in Africa. What are you talking about? Um, so, so there, there, we just don't know. He happens to come from a country, Cote d'Ivoire, I was mentioning to one of the classes yesterday. Um, Cote d'Ivoire has one of the most, the Ebrié people of Cote d'Ivoire, one of the most democratic and extraordinary systems of traditional governance. It's an entire class of age that is in charge of managing the village for a four year period. Extraordinary. Um, uh, system that nobody studies. We we go to the festival, <laughs> right? So we with the, the other the other thing is that uh, um, foreigner foreigners made our culture, our philosophy into folklore, right? So so the party that happens when when they do the transfer of power is a big international party. You see people from all over the world coming to the party. Nobody is studying what is actually going on in this community in terms of their conception of power, of governance, and, 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 and with the Ebrier, the men and the women are equal in that, in that, uh, uh, in that governance um, system. So uh, I, to, to me, it is about getting knowledge, and I, I hear you that it, it, there, there will still be choices about what knowledge you go and get, uh, you know, uh, and about what it, it, it is that you will be learning. Um, I, I think that already if we accept that we have to go and get, then, <clears throat> then we can have debates about what it is that we are supposed to go and get. Okay. Any other questions? Final, because <laughs> yes, Dr. Ayo, and then I'll come to the front. Um, thank you so much. It's um, such um, a treat um, to have you here. Um, you came to my class on gender identities and politics in Africa, and it was so special. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to continue the conversation we were having um, this morning in my class about gender um, and politics in Africa. So when we think about Africa in terms of politics, uh, one expression that keeps on coming back is that big man politics, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you talked earlier about dictators um, in Africa, mm -hmm. the bad guys, mm -hmm. right? That all of them, in fact, are mm -hmm. uh, men. And so I, want, I, I wanted you to share with us what it has meant for you as a woman uh, to insert yourself um, on the political landscape mm -hmm. uh, in Cameroon, mm -hmm. right? What drives you, what sustains you? Mm -hmm. um, and then how do you bring other women from Cameroon, other Cameroonian women, mm -hmm. um, into the process and get to demystify mm -hmm. um, the ways in which leadership and political power has been conceived as patriarchal yeah. Yeah. In, uh, in many African nations and societies. Okay, thank you. That's final question here. <laughs> 
it's it's up. Um, oh yes, go ahead. So mm -hmm. I was interested in the introduction to hear that you also work in disability rights, and it, and that's the community that I work in here. So I'd be just very interested to hear a little bit about what you're doing there. Okay, great. Oh, you have the mic, um, yes. Thank you so much for coming. It has been a pleasure listening to uh, your story and your path. My question is regarding industrialization and development. Um, so for the US, for it to go through pre-industrialization to post-industrial world, it had to exploit a lot of minority groups. And in Europe, uh, it exploited the continent and colonized. So through that, they were able to reach a point where now they can sit and think and don't have to worry about uh, industrialization and the problems we face in many African countries. So assuming that we have the natural resources, I mean, it's still up for grabs, but that we actually have a control of our natural resources, do you think many African countries can industrialize without exploiting a group of people? And if you need exploitation for industrialization, um, how can you talk about sociology and human rights and actually giving basis basic access to the whole population. And then if you are divided into different ethnic groups, um, then you start questioning equity within the population. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I knew I shouldn't have asked that last question. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very uh, profound uh, question. Um, so um, my experience as a woman um, in the political landscape in, in Cameroon, um, I think is very similar to the experience <coughs> of women almost anywhere in the world in the political landscape. When you start off, nobody takes you seriously. Um, um, uh, you have to do five times as much uh, to be able to get recognition. Um, uh, you are, uh, you get all kinds of questions which men never get. You know, when I, when I get on a panel, there's always, at the end, you know, we've had this nice policy discussion. And, then, and they say, okay, now we want to go into your secret garden. So we want to know if you're married and how many children and if you cook for your husband. And, you know, <laughs> um, no male politician gets that question. Um, so... Um, so there, there are some of those typical things. Um, personally, I was prepared for that. Uh, I was prepared for that. I will um, uh, say, I, I repeat one thing that I said in your class, which was that before, right before I went to, to politics, I spent 10 years where I did not read a single book by a white, written by a white male. Because in right before I started that, I came to the realization that 90 plus percent of what I had read in my life was written by white males. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I think it's time to get a different perspective about life considering who I am. Um, and that 10 year period for me was extraordinary. That was where I discovered African women in, have been in politics since the 1400s. That is where I discovered the journey of so many women's movements. That is where I discovered that Cameroonian women from 1949 to 1959 with no cell phones, no emails, nothing, wrote over 1,000 petitions to the United Nations demanding their rights as women in a colonized state. Um, so it, it opened up a whole new world for me um, that gave me such strength and so well prepared me for what it was that I was going to face um, getting into this, uh, getting into this um, arena. Um, uh, um, the, the, the other element, uh, so, so I came into that space being fairly sure of what, you know, so far nothing has surprised me. <laughs> uh, things have, you know, angered me quite a bit, but no, but no major uh, uh, surprises because I was, I was prepared for it. The other thing I came in was knowing that I had to draw on the strength of women. Um, personally, I come from an extraordinary line of women. 
uh, who have, you know, who have always uh, been uh, outstanding. People ask me sometimes, where do you get the courage? Where do you get the, and I think about my grandmothers and I think, they're like, she's at like 50%. She's still got a long ways to go, you know. Uh, um, so um, I think that uh, in, in, in terms of just, I, I knew I just had to get out there and I had to do it. And I knew that I had to do three times as much. I knew that, uh, uh, you know, they were going to question. So I've been in Cameroonian politics for 10 years now. They're finally starting to take me seriously. <laughs> Guys show up, and in six months, they're serious. They're very serious candidates. Um, but um, you know, I so, so so I knew. I just knew that that was that was what I had to do. I knew I also had to draw on those grassroots women. And so, what we had on the board is we do that with women all the time, building up women, having women in our in the leadership of our organization. Um, you know, and I'm very deliberate. I had. Uh, three women journalists in my office the other day, and I was like, "You're not writing the stories. You are not writing the stories." You know, so, so now, you know, so, so, so the other thing I'm careful about is that I don't want to become the token woman. I don't want to be, you know. So now, oh, Kyle Walla was there, great tick, you know. <laughs> um, we did our woman thing, you know. She was there, and and so I was challenging these journalists because. Right now, the grassroots movement in Cameroon is populated by women. And I said, I, where are the stories? Where are the stories about these women? Um, so, so I will push um, until we, you know, we bring those, those, those voices um, to the table. Um, can you, uh, disabilities, yes, disabilities. So, um, so we started off saying we're going to work with every marginalized group. Um, that for us was women, young people, people living with disabilities, and um, workers in the informal sector. So those are our four groups that we that we work with um, in a very targeted fashion. Um, what we did in our party, for example, so first thing was that we brought the issue to the table. It was part of our political program, and we were like, you know, what are the responses that we are we are providing? Um, as, govern as government. The second thing that we did uh, was that um, we made a quota on our lists. Uh, Cameroon works with a list system. So when you go for a council election, for example, you as a party put up 25 names. Um, and we uh, made a quota. F we have a quota for people with disabilities. We have a quota for um, young people. And we have a quota for um, people of the opposite sex on any list. Um, and so that, especially in the municipal election of 2013, it was fantastic. We had, um, we had that quota, it was filled in. During the campaign, we had some really amazing people living with disabilities who were candidates and then who were on the platforms and who were you know, uh, um, um, debating, guess what happens? Every party went out scrambling, looking for people with disabilities. Um, so for us, it was fantastic because the issue was brought to the table, um, and uh, um, we also gave voice. You know, uh, um, um, we do work with associations of people with disabilities on more specific issues and more uh, issues on a day-to-day -day where they are dealing with with with, with government. Can you industrialize without exploiting? I am hoping so. <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, uh, I think that, you know, we, once again, like I say, I think we have to play with history and we have to play with technology and, and, and every innovation that is futuristic to correct what others have done. In, in, in the past. So I do believe that we can, that, that we can build, for example, um, infrastructure and so on that is environmentally sustainable, that is um, built without abuse of human rights, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but it's definitely something that really needs for us to be able to sit down and figure, and figure it out. 
um, uh, you talked about ethnicity and how do we balance uh, uh, representation. So um, the, the, the way that we conceive even our transition is that the conversations start at village level and they move up to the, the municipality level and then from there up uh, uh, to the regions until they get to the national level. So first thing is to make sure that all the groups are included in whatever national conversations you are having. Um, you are not, in Cameroon, we have 260 ethnicities. You're not going to get them all represented in government or all represented in this place or in that place. What I believe that you need to do is make sure that they have access to basic services. That is where equity begins, is that did you give the same opportunity to everybody? So did you give water, electricity, healthcare, education to everybody? And then I think that when you do that, you should allow merit to, um, to balance things out. Now that said, um, there are some tricky questions. We have parts of the country, um, Cameroon has a very high literacy rate. Um, about 78% for women and, and over 80% for men. Um, and, uh, but we have parts of the country where literacy is 40%. Um, so very clearly you will have to do specific things in certain regions to, to level the, the, the playing field. But I see, I see equity more as did you give opportunity f to everybody in an equitable manner rather than is, is every person represented, is every ethnicity represented at every uh, place where decision making is going on? Yeah? Yes, we have to. So I, <laughs> oh. I, I have one question for yeah. you before. Uh, I'm check my phone and try to turn up. One, uh, one question first and then we'll wrap it up. But I just say, okay. curiosity. Um, politics is, a, is often about making coalitions, and mm -hmm. I'm curious who there is in Cameroon who you most want in your tent and, and have not been able to get there and why? Whew. <laughs> good, uh, uh, good question. So the, one of the instruments of dictatorships is to ensure that people cannot make coalitions. So for example, in Cameroon, to go to a local election, which is the best place to start making a coalition. You got 25 people on a list, you could be two, three parties on that list and everybody would still have candidates. The law does not allow us to do that. For people to be on that list, they can only be from one party. We have actually done it in spite of that. In 2013, when we went to elections, we had five parties together and we just decided that this list in this municipality was gonna be under this party's name and this list was gonna be under this party's name and so on. And so um, we went that route. Right now, um, amongst the top leaders, we are in an election year. I don't believe we should go to elections with BIA. There are people who believe that we should go to elections. So um, there's just, I would say five of us who are right now in the top political leadership in, in Cameroon. Um, we are talking to each other. The difficulty is that um, we don't quite agree on strategy. So while I feel that we should use our strength to weigh in on process, before we go to an election, because we've been going to elections with Bia for 25 years, you never win. He wins at 80%, 90%. Um, so um, so uh, uh, while I feel that way, some of my colleagues um, have analyzed it differently and feel that they want to go in as a, as, a, as a presidential candidate. I can't argue, that's where I was in 2011. Um, so, uh, so, why, so we're talking to each other. I'm hoping that we are going to be able to use our collective strength. The Anglophone issue, right, right just before I came here, I hosted a meeting of these, of these five leaders. 
Um, and uh, where I believe that we can begin to act together and where we don't have any disagreement is on the Anglophone issue. Um, and I'm hoping that if we begin to work together, we will you know, um, find ways. But, but, but what has happened is that they have often said, form a coalition, make one candidate to be against. That's not going to work. We're five people who want to be president. <laughs> <laughs> and you define it as, as parties and not as you know, uh, low wage workers or middle wage workers or, or something like that in terms of who you want. Yes, so, so, so that's the political coalition. In terms of the groups in society, so the other thing that um, at least our dictatorship has done is to, be, to ensure that nobody can organize. And so trade unions have been under attack for 57 years. Every time that a group of workers starts to you know, look like it can actually uh, 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 carry out action against the government, they go in, they use every instrument. Money, they'll buy the leaders off. Violence, repression, you know, wh whatever way they can, they will break it up. Um, so, um, but we are working with non-traditional groups. And what we have learned right now is that instead of trying to work with a formal group, we work with informal groups. We, we're fine for you all not to have a name, not to have a bureau, and you're a group of market women who want to work with us. You are a group of motorcycle taxi drivers who want to, 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 to work with us, and that we are um, doing. The, the, the group that we're working really hard to get in a coalition um, is the church. For us, that is a group that could seriously impact the way, uh, the way things go. Um, and right now, they are divided. Even they are divided. Yeah. yeah. OK, well, thank you so much. Whoop. We have one more question. One more uh, question. Yes. If I can ask. Yes. Okay. Very, very quick. Yeah. You mentioned Spanish, but is English the universal language of Cameroon at all levels, leadership? And, or no, French no. Is. French. Yeah. French. French is the, it's spoken by 80%. Okay, of the well, population. before everyone runs out, let me just thank you, and I hope you'll all join me in thanking Paul for a great <laughs>